All right. Good morning, everybody. I thought we'd uh, get started here. I uh, hope everyone's having a good morning. Um, my name is John Hilson. I'm a partner at uh, Denton's in Edmonton. We have uh, two speakers uh, this morning. Um, we have with us come all the way from Toronto, very nice of her to uh, come for this, is Catherine McCullough. She's a partner in our Toronto office. She's going to be uh, speaking about drones in the construction uh, industry. Um, so uh, that's very nice of her to come. I won't uh, do the uh, very obvious dad joke about droning on and so forth because I'm sure we all contemplated that one in the parking lot as we walked up here. So we were going to have a, a second speaker, uh, Simon Elzen Hoskin uh, from our office, but unfortunately uh, Simon had to decline. He had a bit of a, a family emergency last evening. Uh, so he's dealing with that, and we obviously wish uh, him the best of luck with that. And then uh, uh, second of all, I'm going to be uh, speaking about a recent decision uh, with respect to uh, Public Works Act claims, uh, which are things that are becoming increasingly relevant as uh, the, shall we say, the natural economy of Alberta begins to uh, decline and the government-based economy of Alberta uh, steps in. So... Um, but uh, prior to that, I thought I would just uh, provide a brief introduction with respect to uh, Catherine. Catherine, um, who I met just this morning, uh, is uh, from Calgary, uh, but um, notwithstanding that, she seems like a pleasant person. And uh, she went to uh, university at the uh, University of Alberta and has been a partner, uh, and is a partner, I should say, in our uh, Toronto office and has been with our firm for eight years. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I'll pass the uh, table or the chair over to uh, Catherine McCullough. Just to, before I do that, though, there's obviously breakfast there uh, behind, coffee as well, water and juice, etc. Um, this is being broadcast on the internet, so I'm now uh, mega famous. Um, and unfortunately, the people on the internet won't be able to enjoy the breakfast, but I can tell them that it's wonderful. So, all right. So without further ado, I'll pass things over to Catherine McCullough. So I'll talk to you in a few moments. Thanks, John. And um, I will say the, um, the drone jokes had occurred to me this morning too, but I wasn't going to bore everyone with them. Um, I, and, and also John's told me that he has um, several really fun um, and exciting images in his PowerPoint this morning. I do not, um, um, but I do have some interesting stuff and I think I have um, the most interesting topic today, talking about drones. Um, I am a dispute resolution lawyer primarily um, with a focus on aviation and drone regulation. Um, more interestingly, I'm a private pilot, and I also have my drone uh, basic operations certificate that I got recently. So, um, without further ado, um, we'll be talking about drones and construction this morning. And just having spoken with a few of you this morning, I, I understand that some of you already are using drones in your business, which is uh, fantastic. Um, and I'm sure to the extent you aren't, um, people are um, dreaming up ways that you might be able to incorporate them because the efficiency um, that they can achieve is undeniable. And um, when we talk about how they're being used in the construction industry, it all comes down to my, my final point, that they give you access to data. Using the right software, they can um, obtain data that you otherwise couldn't get or could only get with great difficulty. Um, so they're being used to streamline information gathering at the beginning of projects. Um, they're being used to survey land and inspect land. Um, they're increasing communication among teams when projects are ongoing and communication with clients. Um, and um, building envelope inspection is now available in a way that it wasn't previously. Um, trying to get um, someone on the side of a skyscraper to figure out whether there's heat loss um, is something that's near impossible um, until now. So the use cases are endless. These are just a few, and I'm sure, I'm sure you know of others. 
Um, a really quick case study for you this morning. Um, you can find more details about this on DJI.com. That's the manufacturer of a drone or of drones um, that were used in this project. So this is um, an arena that I think has either just opened or is about to open in the coming weeks um, just outside Dallas. Um, they used a fleet of 10 drones as part of um, this two-year build. Um, it was the general contractor that had an in house um, flight department that used the drones in 75% of the projects completing this um, arena. They used the drones on a daily basis to monitor progress. Management teams were aware of real-time advancements, setbacks, and risks that came up during the build process. They were able to obtain information mid-build so they could compare against drawings and then also use that information to create as-built drawings. Um, and in terms of the efficiencies, the stats that they report are they believe that inspection times were reduced by 80%. So tasks that would normally take them days using their traditional methods were taking hours. And throughout the two-year process, they believe that um, the project team saved five hours per week on meetings. So really tangible um, benefits to incorporating, um, incorporating drones into your whole processes. Um, this morning, I'll give you a brief overview of the regulations. I won't get into too much detail because I don't want to put you to sleep, um, but I'll give you the high-level points and some of the reasoning um, behind them that Transport Canada has communicated. Um, we'll talk about the relative benefits of launching your own in-house flight department, which is tempting for a lot of reasons, um, versus hiring a drone services operator. I'm, I'm quite certain my own bias will show through them, which I think is the best, best one from a risk perspective. Um, and then finally, we'll talk a bit about operations on a construction site um, with a focus to ways to limit um, your own liability exposure when a drone is around. So the framework. Aviation in Canada is federal, ugh. Try that again. Aviation kit is federally regulated. Um, the applicable regulations to drone use are set out under the Canadian Aviation Regulations under the Aeronautics Act. Um, this past June, Canada got brand new regulations, uh, which are world leading in a number of ways. Um, they're, I'll explain how. Um, they're only related to visual line of sight operations. So what that means is the pilot must have the drone in their sight at all times. There's some limited exceptions to that where a pilot's working with a visual observer, but essentially somebody needs to have eyes on it at all times. Um, and they only apply to drones weighing up to 25 kilograms. So cargo drones that you see in the news and passenger drones are so far outside the limits of that. Um, so the regulations are quite circumscribed, but most of the drones that are in use regularly now are, are within the envelope that are regulated. Um, the operations are regulated based on the risk associated with the operation, not based on the type of operation. So um, in some places, and, and what was formerly the case in Canada, was a certain set of regulations would apply if you're flying as a hobbyist recreationally, and then another set of regulations would apply if you're flying commercially. Not the case anymore, because that distinction ignores the risk that can be associated with an operation. So now, if you're flying away from people, away from buildings, in more rural settings, you have um, much more freedom to fly and fewer regulations to adhere to, versus if you're flying more complex scenarios around buildings, around people, over people, you need... Um, um, more advanced um, training and equipment and so on. So those are the two categories of operations um, in Canada now, basic operations and advanced operations. The regulations now have formalized knowledge requirements for pilots, which is great because previously there were no um, set of um, knowledge requirements that a, pil a pilot had to have in order to con conduct operations near people. Um, this is one step towards professionalizing um, the industry so that the public really can be certain of um, the caliber, quality, and competence of pilots that are flying um, this machinery near them. 
drones must now be registered. Um, there are certain manufacturing requirements for advanced operations. And in some cases, if you want to fly over people, the drone has to be equipped with something like a parachute so that if there's a mechanical um, issue, it will slowly descend rather than falling and hitting someone or hitting something with great force. And into the future, I gave you a bit of a preview. Um, it, we see in the news almost daily about Domino's Pizza delivering your pizza and Amazon delivering your package. Um, while all that is on the horizon because that's where money is to be made um, in the industry, um, it's, it's very far away, both from a technological perspective and a regulatory perspective. Um, the, the biggest question that um, policymakers are trying to crack right now are how to integrate drones into our airspace, because it's, it's traditionally been based upon um, a pilot on board an aircraft communicating with another person on the ground where everyone can see one another. A drone can't be seen, so it adds a real level of risk into our current Current, um, airspace structure. So um, Canada, I think it was, it was a few months ago, Transport Canada said that it'll be about three years before we even start to see some more regulations that allow for beyond visual line of sight. So flight by a drone when the pilot can't actually lay eyes on it. There are a whole bunch of other laws that also apply to drone operations. Um, and, and I hope you're all getting a flavor for why, um, why I, I may be leaning towards hiring somebody to do your drone operations. Um, in every province, there are at least six statutes that apply to the operations. And as the operation gets more complex, um, there are more potential pitfalls. So the Aeronautics Act is the um, overarching statute that deals with um, aviation operations um, and um, with which any company conducting aviation operations needs to be well versed. Uh, the Radio Communication Act applies to certain spectrum usage, um, counter drone measures that many large landowners are interested in. Um, the federal privacy statute, PIPIDA, applies to commercial drone operators or anyone using a drone for commercial purposes, meaning you need to be aware of how you're collecting and how you're storing personal information. Uh, municipal bylaws more and more becoming something to contend with. I learned recently that uh, the city of Vancouver has proposed a bylaw that essentially um, requires um, people to have machinery that allows for flight over people, so it's the highest standard of manufacturing threshold um, to be used if you're going to fly in Vancouver at all. So it would mean no hobbyists, no, um, no use of machines that are still tens of thousands of dollars, but if they don't have this specific safety equipment, they can't even be flown within the city of Vancouver. So um, more and more municipalities are wading into this um, aviation law um, um, area that's, that's federally regulated, making things more complicated and more complicated for operators to comply. Um, and then um, provincial trespass statutes. So what should you do? Should you launch your own in-house flight department or hire someone? Um, if you're a hobbyist and you're flying a drone on a farmer's field, the stakes are very low. But as soon as you're flying a drone near your equipment, your people on site, um, in populated areas, the stakes become very, very high very quickly. So this is um, a decision that needs to be made before any drone takes off, in my view. Um, I'll discuss the relative pros and cons of each, um, and, and I expect there'll be questions on this area afterwards, so please don't hesitate. So we'll start with um, launching your own flight department. It is tempting because all you need to do is go to Best Buy, buy a drone and you're flying, um, but not so. Um, there are a myriad of laws to comply with um, that, that um, require the attention of a professional in my view. In any event, if you're flying your own drone, your data is being kept in-house. So any of the um, information that you gather is all within your own four walls. Um, our, our privacy and data colleagues will tell you that the weakest link when it comes to data security are third-party providers. Um, so keeping data in-house is a really big deal if possible. 
Um, the services are on demand. They're your own. You can pick it up whenever. Um, you may purchase equipment that's specifically suited to the type of operation you have, um, which has many benefits. Um, and your pilots are familiar with your industry because they're your own. But the con side is, is much more lengthy. And I've highlighted a few of the, the key considerations in my view. Um, we all have our smartphones and we all know that after a year or so they become obsolete. Um, this is happening with drone technology, but even more quickly. So you can invest tens of thousands of dollars into a fleet and before long um, be in need of upgrades and, and um, new equipment. Um, additionally, you may decide that there are multiple reasons why you want to use a drone in your company, and you need different drones to deal with different weather conditions, to um, carry different payloads, so that may be different sensors or different cameras, such that you would be investing in a small um, army or fleet of drones without really getting the use um, that you need when you need it. Um, you need competent pilots, you need expert pilots, really. Um, so an in-house flight department requires you to stay on top of their training um, and ensure that they continue to be um, the experts that they need to be. Um, they have to be aware of and comply with aeronautical no laws. They need to know how to access and read aviation weather forecasts. They need to know um, how to check into airspace changes, and the list goes on. Um, they need standard operating procedures. Um, they need to be in the right place for where you need them. Um, insurance is a, is a huge one. So um, aviation activity is carved out of um, almost all commercial liability policies um, and needs to be purchased separately. And if it's not, the activity could very well um, be uncovered. So if you are flying a drone and there's an accident of some kind, your insurer may not um, answer the call. And that's, that's, a, that's a big problem. Um, Issues of vicarious liability arise and are different province to province, so I won't weigh in on Alberta. But if you have your own employees flying the drones, then it could be um, any misstep that they make could fall back on the company. And all of, all of what I've been saying comes back down to risk. You are carrying the risk if you have your own in-house flight department. Now, in, in some cases, like the case study I spoke about a few minutes ago, that makes sense. If you are prepared to have a full team that's dedicated to flying drones, then, then it makes sense to carry that risk. But if you're not willing to go all the way, then um, in my view, it's an unacceptable risk to have for your organization just to be able to simply fly drones a few times. So let's move on to hiring an operator. And it's it's a good segue because all of those negatives that I've just talked about, really, they fall to the other side of the ledger. So they fall under the umbrella of what the services operator has to worry about. They have to make sure they have the right equipment. They have to make sure they're training their pilots and they're maintaining their um, operating procedures and their emergency procedures. Um, they must carry insurance and they bear the risk of accidents happening. Um, um, during the course of an operation. Um, the cons are the data point again. They're, they're collecting and storing your data. Um, they may not be as familiar with the industry or the job sites that you are, and um, um, almost certainly you'll require a contract with them of some kind. So overall, um, it, it comes down to the following question. It's whether aviation is core to your business. If it's not, then I strongly recommend to um, everyone who asks that they hire out um, to drone services providers. Um, still, um, um, hiring a, an operator is really inexpensive. Um, over time, that will, will probably, the cost will go up, but people are really um, interested in getting experience and exposure and using their machinery. And there's a real vibrancy among drone pilots, um, making them willing to work for um, a pretty good rates. So given all of the, all of the factors that I've discussed, um, if aviation's not core to your business, I, I really do recommend um, hiring someone.
now a few a few tips for using drones on construction sites and um, the focus of these points are ways to limit your potential liability exposure um, when the drone's being operated. And that's, you know, in some ways, if you're using the drone yourself or if you're hiring someone. Um, the biggest um, risk factors come up when the drones are being operated near people. Um, that's your biggest liability risk from a lawsuit perspective um, or other liability. Um, the, the regulations require um, drone operators to keep their drones away from people at various distances when they're not involved in an operation. So to be involved in an operation, you need to be a crew member or you need to be someone who has no other task other than watching or working with the drone. So if you're on a construction site and someone is completing a project but they're kind of watching the drone as well, in my view, those are not people involved in the operation and you need to stay back from them. Um, if your drone operator is operating under a basic certification, they have to stay at least 30 meters away from people. That's horizontal distance at any given time. And if they're operating under an advanced certificate, they only need to be five meters away from people. But um, to the extent that you can keep the drones back, then um, the risk of hitting someone um, is greatly decreased. Um, um, the other factor is the privacy point. So keeping the drone away from people near the operations means that there's a reduced risk of you inadvertently collecting personal information associated with that person that you would need to care for in a certain way in order to be compliant with the federal privacy statutes. So, and that's even if they're employees. So um, many good reasons to keep, um, to keep the drone back from people. Um, Another key way to limit your exposure um, is to hire a competent operator. Um, a competent operator will, um, before the job begins, inspect your site, consider what kind of atmospheric conditions exist in the site that they may have to contend with, and will be able to give you their professional advice on the right kind of drone to use for that job. That's really what you're looking for. You're looking for someone who's a specialist who can read the situation in a way that you cannot. Um, I, I always um, recommend a written agreement um, between a customer and a drone services operator, and I've seen some pretty terrible ones so far. Um, but there are a few things that must be in that agreement from your perspective. Um, that's a limitation of liability, so that to the extent there's any issue, the drone services operator um, owns that, and that they indemnify you. Um, there are, depending on the circumstances, other clauses that will be a big deal, copyright, dealing with the data, um, and so on. But, but the big one is this limitation of liability and indemnity. Um, the operator will also have insurance. Um, and in a number of cases I've seen recently, the operators have agreed to include um, the person hiring them as an additional insured under the policy, which is a, is a huge deal from a risk perspective. Um, and then a few other points. Um, there are physical segregation me method, uh, physical segregation methods to keep a drone away from people. Some people use nets. Some people use plexiglass. There are ways to try and um, limit that risk, particularly if you have um, work ongoing on site while the drone's there. And then um, something that shouldn't be discounted is signage. It costs almost nothing, but when you're looking to defend yourself after an incident has happened, you want to show that you put people on notice that there was a drone around. And putting signs up, emailing not notices to your employees is a really easy way to show that you're doing your diligence beforehand. And then finally, um, Denton's runs a drone law blog that um, keeps everyone updated on the legal um, changes. Um, I, I noticed afterwards, I didn't mean that there are other drone blogs that are legal, or that are illegal, rather, um, but it's a blog, it's a blog dealing with legal matters. There aren't any others in Canada and post lots of updates there. So um, any questions now, I'm happy to take them or, or at the end as well. Thank you. Please.
when we're entering, sorry, as a developer or owner, when we're entering into a CCDC2 contract with a general contractor, et cetera, et cetera, we're pretty familiar with what to ask in terms of insurance and WCB, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not dealing directly with a drone operator. So that might be a general contractor, it might be a, a property manager who's hiring a roof inspector, who's hiring a drone operator. Uh, how do you deal with making sure the requirements are met when it's at arm's length like that? Well, I think they're treated like an, any other um, third party subcontractor. You, know, you are relying on your general contractor to make sure that they're protecting themselves and you when they're hiring subtrades. And I don't see this as any different. Um, you know, you could ask for um, additional assurances when your general contractor is entering into those agreements where you're also covered. Um, but I, I don't see them as any different um, than a subcontractor they would otherwise use. Your, your insurance, if it's an exclusion, is now putting you in a place where uh, if that drone operator has $100,000 worth of insurance, that might not be near enough to comply with the statute. Mm -hmm. But you don't know that you don't have it. Right. Well, um, on the insurance point, um, most commercial operators um, are carrying much more than 100,000. They're carrying at least 5 million. Um, so so it's, it's not the case that you may be so exposed, um, but it's something to think about when you're entering into your, your agreements with your general contractors to build that in and to build in the assurances. And, and you, are, you are relying on them to help give you that information. You, know, you said you don't know what you don't know, um, but that's a discussion that has to be had with the parties you are contracting with. strikes me I'm not sure if this one's working either uh, it is um, two things that would come to mind uh, just from a, a contract perspective right is you could build into the contract I mean it is quite common uh, under construction contracts to have minimum insurance requirements for the general and the general subcontractors and so forth down uh, you could incorporate higher limits to factor in the higher potential liability and also um, specify the types of coverage uh, that would be needed once one knows that a standard CGL policy won't be applying in the context of, a avi of uh, aviation related risks. Um, the other thing that strikes me too, and I was going to ask Catherine about this because it struck me as interesting, <laughs> is when you're talking about, um, say, unforeseen physical circumstances, uh, it's a standard provision that, that, um, that uh, the owner or the general, as the case may be, I guess the general would be a, a more clear, is aware of the physical conditions of the workplace like the in the geotechnical conditions and so forth and and uh, while changes can be added to the contract it's only in the event of unforeseen geological conditions i just wonder given that drones are providing more information than we had available to us five ten maybe even two years ago whether or not that changes what the scope of an unforeseen condition is because it, it's not unforeseen if this technology is applied, right? I, I don't mean to take your uh, take your question from you, but it just struck me as a as a question uh, that arises from that. I. I think it would depend on the policy. What I know about aviation insurance in general is it's almost always excluded from, from any kind of, of um, even that kind of basket coverage that you're talking about. So um, I would be very wary and I would talk to an insurance broker about that certainly. Um, and I would not assume that it covers it just because aviation is one of those automatic red flags. Um, I will respond to the point about um, whether it's foreseeable. 
um, because this is an issue that's coming up in all sorts of contexts where we have no guidance um, from the case law on. Um, um, and it's, it's coming up in the context of the duties that airports have to ward off drone threats. We have all heard about Gatwick about a year ago um, this holiday season. Um, and the question has come up whether airports have to do something to stop that kind of risk. And um, in my opinion, it's, it's no longer unforeseeable that a drone can impact an aircraft in its critical stages of flight. And so um, airports have a duty of care to prevent against foreseeable risks, such as drones. So coming back to what you said, John, um, if um, it's, it's foreseeable that there's a certain issue um, with the geotechnical layout of the site, then in my view, um, you may be obligated to, to engage the kind of technology to see that through. And I had one other. Um, sure. How do you deal with it when your contractual relationships are old? Um, and, and by that, I mean, how, how would you deal with a single tenant building that's leased to somebody under a lease agreement that's 10 or 15 years old that is totally silent on something like drone usage? And, and so in what context would you be using the drone in that scenario? Let's say your, your tenant is responsible for inspecting the roof or right. whatever. What do you do as an right. owner to ensure that right. he's doing what needs to be done yeah. because the lease is silent? Well, um, it's, it's one of those changes in technology that, that better enable you to meet the obligations you have under existing contracts. So to the extent that your contract has language that requires um, someone to do everything they can to ensure they're inspecting properly, then I think that's initially done by way of discussion or by way of, of letter. Um, it's not unforeseen um, to amend contracts to take into account um, this kind of improvement in technology, um, but I think it starts with a discussion um, before, before anything else. I don't know, John, if you have any experience with that kind of matter. I don't, but I can understand the circumstance that you're, you're talking about um, in exactly the context you say, where if the tenant has inspection responsibilities, and previously those inspections would have been conducted in traditional methods, um, whereas now uh, they may seek to gain the, the cost savings advantages that Catherine was talking about in terms of that uh, Dallas arena. Um, and so as a result, the tenant in those circumstances begins to deploy drones to conduct those inspections. <clears throat> what type of the owner in that circumstance might be concerned about the liability that might attract to the owner as a result of the tenant not being sufficiently diligent in terms of its use of drones in that inspection process. Like that's the circumstance you're talking about. I would think in those circumstances, the owner probably has a substantive defense because uh, it's the tenant uh, who's uh, gone sideways as opposed to the owner. But having, you know, sometimes it's sort of cold comfort for an owner to say, uh, for a lawyer to say to an owner, well, you know, you'll ultimately win this one, but in the intervening 10 years, you got yourself a, a less than meritorious lawsuit. They may say, well, uh, that's not really the answer I was looking for, right? Like, uh, um, I would think that in those circumstances, most, um, most leases would contain an indemnity clause. Um, uh, and if they don't, they should. Uh, which would indemnify the owner against liability that attracted to, to the owner as a result of the actions of the tenant. And that would be at the beginning of the lease. And it wouldn't be something that needed to be amended or to specifically make reference to drones. It would just be anything that they did, right? So one could pro uh, seek uh, protections in that. Um, again, you'd be relying upon, you know, I. I the beauty of an indemnity clause is that, you know, you sometimes have lawsuits over or not whether or not the indemnity clause applies, right? So, so as long as there are clever people, um, the ability to actually obtain meaningful protection is, is only as good as the cleverest person, right? So I, there's a fellow in our office who has a great line of 
He said, uh, you know, any idiot with $200 and a typewriter can start the lawsuit, right? And, and it's true about that. It's had to be modernized because the filing fee is now $250, and half of the people don't know what a typewriter is. But, like, the, the principle remains the same, right? So, But I would think the indemnity provisions in a contract would be the type of protection that would be available to you there. So. Thank you. Yes. Have we seen much changes in enforcement with regards to the illegal use of drones or any litigation that's being taken place in the last little while? There's been some enforcement. So the, the best example of that is there were some drones illegally flown over the Raptors Victory Parade downtown Toronto. So there's been some enforcement, but not a lot. Um, my own private view is that um, Transport Canada is using the resources that they have um, to really focus on the regulatory creation side of things and haven't invested that much in enforcement. Um, it, publicly, they, they say otherwise, but I haven't seen much. Um, there's only been one prosecution of a drone offense, and it was um, in Calgary, and it was a number of years ago under the old regulations. So there just really hasn't been that much. Um, to the extent that fines are levied, they're done by ticket. Um, so it's possible that they've been levied, but um, they, there's no way to find out or there's no way to um, see how they were disposed of. So there's really little guidance on that. Um, but operators are up in arms about the lack of enforcement because there are so many compliant operators that jump through all the hoops and do everything right and then non-compliant ones that don't seem to get um, penalized. Um, but with technological advances that um, the RCMP are looking into primarily, they'll be able to spot unauthorized drone flights much more easily. Um, so that's coming down and will assist with enforcement. Okay, with that, I'll hand it over, and any other questions, happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. That was very interesting. And thanks again for uh, coming uh, such a long distance to talk about this uh, interesting and developing area. So um, the next... Uh, the next portion, I'll give everyone a, a few moments if you want to get a, a coffee or, or whatever. We, we have, uh, we, as I said, we were going to have three speakers. We have uh, two, so, so uh, take some uh, extra time. Um, the one thing I was, was going to talk about is on your uh, table, there is a document called Seminar Feedback Form. And these, um, the seminars uh, that we do uh, at Denton's, are part of the client service that we like to provide to our clients. Um, but we want to make sure uh, that we're talking about things that people care about uh, and also uh, that we're um, presenting it in a manner uh, that is accessible to people. Um, so if you had a moment um, and if you could complete the, um, the seminar feedback form and give us um, whatever uh, comments you wanted, uh, compliments are, are great, but criticisms may be a little more useful. Um, uh, so uh, f don't uh, don't spare uh, don't spare our feelings if you think some things could be done better. Um, so can't do anything about the uh, the bacon or the heat of the coffee, but uh, we can do uh, some stuff about uh, other things. So so if you did have a moment and were able to complete the form, it'd be helpful. <clears throat> so. Um, uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, there's a recent uh, uh, decision that was just uh, issued in early October uh, about uh, Public Works Act claims and particularly the nuts and bolts uh, of advancing a Public Works Act claim in terms of the forms that needed to be completed. And it, and it sounds like, a, it sounds like a, at the outset, a mundane point, but it's a really important uh, practice point uh, for claimants under Public Works Act claims. Uh, so I wanted to do a presentation on it because A, it's important, B, it's brand new. Um, C, I was involved in the decision. So, uh, so it's, uh, 
so if you can't toot your own horn, whose can you toot, I suppose? So, so my, uh, my presentation is uh, in terms of the importance of the Public Works Act claim form when adver and advancing a Public Works Act claim. So a real snappy title there. I stayed up all night thinking of that one. So, <clears throat> so during the, uh, the course of the presentation, uh, I'll talk about when claim rights arise under the Public Works Act claim, uh, the process for making a claim, uh, the importance of the statement of public work, pardon me, the importance of the statement of public works act claim form, which is an actual physical piece of paper, uh, and some takeaway messages. And just to give you a, an introduction, the purpose uh, of the, the presentation is to be in form like these guys. Uh, but, uh, just for the video audience there, in case you've never heard of him, he's Connor McDavid. He's, uh, creating a bit of a stir in the city here. So, um, uh, the goal is also to not be in form or to be not out of form. Like, I don't know, say some other example, like, uh, say these guys here, <laughs> the, the Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> <I'm not that. laughs> so that just to see, just to see that again, cause this, this, uh, this uh, technological advance there costs like several million dollars from uh, the Denton's uh, special effects department. So, so it's swivel. <laughs> so uh, the Public Works Act, uh, the Public Works Act uh, up until a few years ago uh, was probably a not particularly well known piece of legislation. It spans about 35 sections and five pages or so. Uh, so it's not a very lengthy, uh, it's not a very lengthy uh, statute. Um, and having uh, sat through a, an all day special chambers uh, application about this involving about uh, 50 lawyers, there seemed to be about uh, five or six decisions involving the Public Works Act claim over the last 40 years. So it's, uh, it's not a statute that gets a lot of not a lot of love, but uh, but uh, it's becoming uh, more and more uh, more and more uh, popular. So people will often tell you uh, that the that the Public Works Act claim is the uh, sister of the Builders Lien Act. It's probably a little unfair. It's probably more like the second cousin of the Builders Lien Act because there is not a great deal of overlap. A true uh, Public Works Act purist will tell you that there is uh, very little relationship between the Builders Lien Act and the Public Works Act claim. But the, the main, log uh, main logic behind the Public Works Act claim is that there are certain uh, types of uh, projects where the Builders Lien, doesn't apl a builder's lien uh, won't apply, like highways, for example. The other thing to keep in mind is that when you're talking about... Um, the builder's lien and its scope. It's important to remember that the ultimate remedy under the Builder's Lien Act is the sale of the land that forms the subject matter of the lien. And so you have to say when you're considering whether or not the builder's lien will apply is would this cause public outrage if this was sold, right? And is it realistic to think of this thing being sold? So when you're talking about a hospital or a school or a roadway, it would cause concern if your children's school was sold, right? Plus there's not a big traffic in used schools in Alberta, right? So, so it's not, uh, or stretches of highway or bridges or hospitals, right? So there are things that form a public uh, good purpose. Uh, and therefore those are generally, although not always, uh, covered by the Public Works Act claim as opposed to the Builders Lien Act. Schools are a dog's breakfast, quite frankly, when it comes to, uh, to uh, the application of the Builders Lien Act because sometimes a school uh, will be covered by, uh, will be subject to the Builders Lien Act and other times it won't. And the only way you learn that is after the fact, right? So, so, but as a general rule, when you're talking about things that have a public work nature to them, they are likely the subject matter of the Public Works Act as opposed to the Builders Lien Act. Um, and the logic for that is, as I said, uh, that there are public policy reasons uh, for not allowing those items to be sold. 
And for that reason, people talk about the Public Works Act as being the builder's lien, equi the equivalent of the builder's lien act in the context of public works. So uh, the Public Works Act uh, creates a claim for a person who provides labor, equipment, materials, or services. So that's the first thing. You have to have done those things, labor, equipment, materials, or services that are used or were reasonably required for use. Um, so I actually have a lawsuit about this provision. This is one that isn't normally disputed, uh, but it, uh, it, it can be. Um, uh, and that uh, labor has to have been used in relation to a contract with the Crown or with respect to the construction, demolition, repair, or maintenance of a public work. So the main way I have found of finding out whether or not something is a public work um, is to call Alberta Infrastructure and ask them whether or not uh, Alberta Infrastructure is at the heart of the, uh, the contract. And I have found them to be quite responsive and quite, uh, they may not be after this gets out on the internet, but at least but before, I, before I let this secret out, they're quite responsive in terms of telling you whether or not something is an Alberta infrastructure contract, right? So, and then most importantly, that you weren't paid. So to recap that, you have to have provided labor, equipment, or materials that were required or reasonably required for use in relation to a project where the crown is a member of the is a contracting party and you weren't paid so in those circumstances you can advance a public works act claim so the claims process under the <clears throat> under the public works act claim there are certain mandatory requirements which the decisions tell us are not mandatory so uh this is uh, one of the reasons why you have lawsuits um so the, but under the statute, at least, uh, claims must be served upon Alberta infrastructure via registered mail. This is one of the mandatory requirements that is not actually mandatory. Um, so you can serve it. it this, I would always encourage someone to serve it via registered mail, but there are decisions out there that say it's not actually required that it be uh, delivered via registered mail, just that it get to Alberta infrastructure. But please send it via registered mail, but you know, don't stay up all night if it goes by courier, right? So, and it must be served within 45 days of the last day on which the labor equipment, materials or services were provided. <clears throat> uh, and so this is a similar language to the Builders Lean Act, right? So this doesn't mean 45 days after someone was last at work or 45 days after someone last delivered materials, it means 45 days after your scope of work or your scope of supply was completed. Because that's the importance of the phrase, last day of which the labor, equipment, materials, or services were provided. It's inelegant language by, by, any, uh, by any count, but that's uh, how that phrase has been interpreted. Uh, and this is a similar, this is one of the areas where the Builders Lean Act and the Public Works Act claim have, uh, pardon me, Public Works Act have very similar language. And so the claim also must be provided in a form satisfactory to the Crown. Now this phrase, in a form satisfactory to the Crown, is the phrase that launched a thousand ships in this, uh, in this lawsuit. Uh, because uh, this, what is a form satisfactory to the Crown is is what this entire dispute uh, involving the uh, Grand Prairie Regional Hospital that I'm about to talk about was all about. So, and the last, uh, last thing is why this becomes important is that if you are a valid Public Works Act claimant, you have priority over the money uh, payable under a Public Works Act contract and priority over everyone, right? So, and that actually provides a higher level of priority than even the Builders Lean Act does. Um, now, there will undoubtedly be a whole new uh, slew of lawsuits um, that are issued over the question of whether the priority that is conveyed by the Public Works Act claim, uh, how that would conflict with bankruptcy legislation, but I'm not going to talk about that today. But I would only mention it just to say that 
the priority that is discussed uh, in the Public Works Act claim is significant uh, and valuable. Um, and so therefore, there is a real tactical advantage uh, for gaining that priority because when you are talking about a general contractor uh, who doesn't have enough money to pay its various subcontractors or which has failed, the priority that the Public Works Act claim can turn zero dollars into significant dollars. And if you also have a situation of where uh, the um, where there are more claimants than there is money available to pay, the ability to elbow out some of the other subcontractors and provide more money for yourself and a bigger piece of the pie uh, obviously provides some uh, economic advantages. So, um, turning to the uh, phrase, in a form satisfactory to the Crown, um, historically, there was, so just to, under, when you are completing a builder's lien, uh, under the Builder's Lien Act, one completes a form that is called a statement of lien. Um, so, and it's a physical piece of paper that says across the top of it, statement of lien. Um, and so uh, there was historically, though, no equivalent to a statement of lien in the Public Works Act. So what would happen is people would sometimes write letters, um, sometimes um, people would do other things, but there was no formalized uh, circumstance. So in about 2007 um, or so, uh, Alberta Infrastructure devised a form called a Statement of Public Works Act claim. Now, this is an actual physical form that looks a lot like a statement of lien, not identical to a statement of lien, but similar. Um, and it was a physical form. Um, and so, and there is a copy of the present uh, uh, version of the Statement of Public Works Act claim. So as you'll see, if you're familiar with statements of lien, it contains much of the same information that appears on a statement of lien. So, and this is a document that is available on the internet and there are paper copies of it all over the place. Um, so the problem with this document, uh, however, this Statement of Public Works Act claim is that um, the Statement of Public Works Act claim isn't discussed in the Public Works Act claim. As I said, it's a very short document. And the only thing that it says in terms of the way that one conveys its claim is that it must be in a form satisfactory uh, to the Crown. And so when you see the word form, form has two meanings in that, right? Form can mean a piece of paper, right? This is my form, I'm completing it out. Or it could be the more general sense of the word form, just meaning the the mode, right, in which the information is uh, conveyed. So the question is, well, what does, what form are they talking about here? Um, and the other thing is, is that uh, a statement of lien is an actual physical document that is created by uh, regulation under the Builders Lien Act. So it has legislative uh, backing to it, right? The Statement of Public Works Act claim form is just a document that Alberta Infrastructure just uh, devised and started to circulate, but it has no actual legislative backing, right? So, so, uh, so, um, so the question is, well, <clears throat> what happens if you do not use the Statement of Public Works Act claim form when you're advancing a Public Works Act claim? Is that fatal or, uh, or does that just uh, an inconsequential error? Or what's the significance of that? Well, luckily, uh, uh, the, um, the uh, Grand Prairie General Hospital, uh, sorry, Regional General Hospital uh, came to the aid of that uh, decision that I'm sure has kept many of us up all night. Um, so, so, uh, so this is a decision from 2019, October of 2019. And as I said, it arises from the Grand Prairie Regional Hospital. So brief uh, background on the uh, Grand Prairie Regional Hospital. So this is a multi-hundred million dollar project, maybe billion now. I, it's, a, it's a project that has grown uh, significantly over, the, over time. Um, so 
there are about $60 million worth of Public Works Act claims uh, that have been issued in relation to the Grand Prairie Regional Hospital. So in, uh, in 2019, about $30 million was paid into court by Alberta Infrastructure in an attempt to deal with these $60 million worth of Public Works Act claim. Now, it's been a while since I was uh, taking math in high school, but I, I do know that $60 million is quite a bit larger than $30 million. One might even say it's $30 million less. So, so that created a problem because you got $60 million worth of claims and only $30 million to go around at present. So to make matters worth, about $22 million was paid out pursuant to a court order, and there was $8 million left, right? So... The, uh, then there's a fight over this remaining $8 million. So there were, there were basically three camps over this fight over $8 million, which is ongoing. And if you're one of the Public Works Act claimants, like the party for whom we act, we, we obviously take the position uh, that there's $38 million uh, that we're fighting about as opposed to eight. But for in the short term, let's say uh, that we're talking about in the immediate context, eight million dollars so there are three camps there's alberta infrastructure on one side who is the owner in this context there are the group of parties who completed a statement of public works act claim form they actually completed the document that says statement of public works act claim sent it via registered mail uh, to alberta infrastructure less than 45 days prior to the end of their scope of work Okay, so they look on paper to be bulletproof in this circumstance, right? So then there is the next group of uh, parties. They are the parties who had not completed a Statement of Public Works Act claim form, but who claim to be Public Works Act claimants, notwithstanding the fact that they didn't complete the form. And so they comprise a significant amount of people uh, with a significant amount of monetary claims. And so since there are roughly $30 million worth of remaining claims and only $8 million to pay them, at this stage at least, the, there was a desire amongst the people who had completed Public Works Act claims forms to shrink the number of claimants who could possibly access this $8 million. Because uh, if someone else gets zero, that's more for me, right? So not me personally, tragically, but, uh, but other, uh, other people. <clears throat> so a fight ensued. Um, so I, I didn't act uh, for any of the people who did not complete uh, statements of Public Works Act claim forms. The parties for whom we acted completed the forms and submitted them on time and to the right place and for the right, am right amount, because that's just how we do things at Dentons, right? So, <clears throat> but... Um, there were a significant number of people who didn't, right? And so, and I, I'll try and be, I, I don't agree with this position, but just to be, to give you a sense of the battle, I'm going to try and fairly describe uh, their position. So they said, um, there's nothing in the Public Works Act claim that mandates the use of the, the use of the Statement of Public Works Act claim form. And, and that's, that's true, right? They're, that is correct. There is nothing in the Public Works Act claim that says you must use the form that says Statement of Public Works Act claim. Um, and they also pointed to the prior judicial latitude um, that existed with respect to Public Works Act claims. And yes, there is a significant amount of latitude uh, that demandatorizes the various mandatory, uh, seemingly mandatory at least, rules in the Public Works Act claim. And so they said, why not this as well? Um, um, and in the specific context of the Grand Prairie Regional Hospital, so what happened is how the payment process worked there is that the general contractor would submit an application for progress payment and that application for progress payment would, uh, in some circumstances at least, contain uh, the invoices that had been issued by subcontractors and suppliers. That application for progress payment would then be viewed by a payment certifier, and the payment certifier uh, would then issue a progress, sorry, a payment certificate 
or there would be deductions to the payment certificate. Uh, and then you would have a payment certificate, which then the Crown would proceed to pay on. And so the non-form-based uh, claimants uh, said, well, I mean, obviously the form in which we submitted uh, our claim to the Crown was satisfactory to the Crown because the Crown's payment certificate, pardon me, payment certifier reviewed our claim and issued payment certificates and said you should pay this. So therefore, it's obviously in a form satisfactory to the Crown because they were approved. I don't agree with that, but that's what they said. Um, and so as a result, the form, non-form-based Public Works Act claimants said in that context, even invoices would be a form satisfactory to the Crown. So we submitted invoices, that's a form satisfactory to the Crown, as evidenced by the fact that payment certificates were issued. So we're fine. Um, so that was their position. Um, <clears throat> now the, the people who completed a statement of Public uh, Works Act claim form, let's just call them, just use an objective term like the good guys. Um, so, so <clears throat> they said, no, 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 that's, that's nonsense. Uh, and so they said, uh, that, that, uh, that they had priority over the $8 million to the exclusion, uh, of the non-form based claimants. And, and there was basically three main points, right? Number one was well, the statute says it has to be a form satisfactory to the Crown. Alberta Infrastructure has put out a form uh, and said this is what you should complete when completing a, advancing a Public Works Act claim. So clearly, the Statement of Public Works Act claim form must be the form that is satisfactory to the Crown. Otherwise, why does it exist, right? Um, which a uh, pretty sensible argument, I thought. So, so. Uh, the second, uh, the second one is that, the second concern is that this picked up on the payment certifier. Um, and so this was, the problem with the whole payment certifier uh, argument is while it makes some sense in the context, the specific context of the Grand Prairie Regional Hospital, like the Public Works Act claim will apply to all Public Works Act claims that exist in Alberta until the end of time, right? So you can't sort of have uh, an interpretation of the doc of that statute that is so specific to one specific project. Um, and so the concern was is that if you played out the logic of the payment certifier argument is you would effectively have a two-tier system for advancing Public Works Act claims. Because a general contractor uh, who is in the context of a payment certifier application for progress payment contract, that general contractor would simply have to submit an invoice. Uh, and that would be a Public Works Act claim. But if you were a subcontractor or a supplier, you'd have a separate system for advancing a Public Works Act claim. Um, and you would have so what you'd have to do is you'd issue your invoice to the general contractor. You'd have to hope and pray uh, that the general contractor included your invoice in its invoice to the owner. Um, and if you weren't confident with your hopes and prayers, uh, then you would also have to submit a Public Works Act claim form. So you would have two steps, whereas a general would have one. And <clears throat> that wouldn't be proper because if you're going to have a universal system for advancing claims, there should be one rule for one people as opposed to uh, one rule for a particular segment, one rule for another segment, and it just keeps on going on and on. <clears throat> and so uh, that was the concern is that the interpretation that was being put forward by the non-form-based claimants would create a multi-tiered system that favored one segment of the population over the other. And the other, the other, I think, probably most compelling argument uh, was that um, service of a valid Public Works Act claim triggers certain rights. Um, number one, from a practical perspective, although it doesn't say this in the statute, practically, once a Public Works Act claim is advanced, the owner will normally stop payments to a general contractor. 
And so that's a pretty significant uh, circumstance, or else they will deduct the amount of the Public Works Act claim from the next progress draw to the general. So if you are, if you're talking about millions of dollars, um, that's a pretty significant uh, circumstance. Moreover, once a Public Works Act claim has been issued, a valid one, is it allows Alberta infrastructure to make direct payments to subcontractors or suppliers of a general. Uh, it also allows Alberta infrastructure to compromise any disputed liability. And incidentally, it, it, actually, <coughs> it actually allows Alberta infrastructure to do this. And the statute says that the person who gets jilted as a result of this compromise has actually no recourse, which is, uh, it's, it's an astounding uh, piece of legislation in that context. Um, and so, so as a result, the thought was is that we should all know when a Public Works Act claim is being made. We shouldn't sort of have to hope and guess in terms of what's being done. Plus, in the particular context of the Alberta, or sorry, of the Grand Prairie General Hospital, this was a multi-year project where there were multiple uh, contractors. And at the application, it was pointed out quite cleverly, I might add, uh, by uh, one of the other parties they had determined how many invoices had actually been issued uh, by the various contractors and subcontractors and suppliers. And, and there, were lit, there were thousands, right? And so they talked about the apps, you know, that there had effectively been, you know, 10,000 Public Works Act claims issued in relation to this if what the, uh, the non-form-based claimants were uh, advocating was correct. And that you know, you would have to hire an army of people at Alberta Infrastructure in order to simply process Public Works Act claims, if even an invoice could be one. And it may all be for nothing, because you don't know whether or not that invoice is unpaid and is actually a Public Works Act claim, or simply an invoice. So it was a, uh, you know, it was a, the argument was, well, this would be, uh, this would be chaos, and, you know, cats and dogs would, uh, fall from the sky and you know it was uh, that type of argument which is uh, which is you know oftentimes convincing so as a result uh, the court agreed that only parties who had submitted a statement of Public Works Act claim form had priority over the eight million dollars so the form uh, was victorious right so so um, uh, for now. Uh, the decision is under appeal, obviously, and will probably be appealed multiple times uh, because there's quite a lot of uh, money at stake, right? Um, so the takeaway message of this presentation, there, there are, is really only one, uh, in, and it's that when you are completing a Public Works Act claim, complete the Statement of Public Works Act claim form because it will save you all this bother. Um, and so uh, I've often wondered why that wasn't done in the first place, because it would have saved a lot of time, but uh, um, one day I will learn. Um, uh, and number two, an invoice is not sufficient. So if you want to advance a Public Works Act claim, this decision stands uh, for the principal, complete the form. So uh, a letter is also not sufficient. So um, uh, if you have any uh, questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, but that is the one takeaway message there. There's a form out there. Please use it. Uh, it'll make it much more effective and save you a lot of uh, a lot of problems and deprive Dentons of a topic at a Breakfast for the Mind seminar. So, so yes, yeah. Uh, it does include design work. Um, yeah, it doesn't worry. Uh, that's, uh, I'm actually litigating that issue in the context of reasonably required for use. But yes, it does include design work. So architecture work, design work, design drawings, things of that nature. So it, it isn't a purely sticks and bricks concept of work, right? So. Is the Builders Lean Act sticks and bricks? No. No, the Builders Lean Act also allows for liens to be advanced in relation to design work. It's something that improves the land, right? Traditionally, it's a sticks and bricks type of legislation, but it, it has broadened to include things. So there was historically 
uh, arguments about whether or not demolition, because you're, you're actually removing things from it, uh, but that is also allowed, and it's specifically mentioned uh, in the Public Works Act claim, demolition is. And so I think if you ask me uh, sort of an instance of government foresight in terms of legislation to try and preempt lawsuits, so. Yeah, any other questions? And they don't have to be simply questions about uh, Public Works Act claims. They can also deal with drones if something is, uh, yeah, yes. Another question. One of the arguments that we always get into in our office is whether submitting an invoice and an invoice getting paid, whether it's a form of contract. Is there any? Uh, so, uh, okay, so a contract, so contracts can be uh, in writing, obviously, but the vast majority of contracts that a person enters into are verbal, right? So, and a contract is simply formed by someone, just pure offer, acceptance, and then some convey of value, right? So if you say, if someone says, hey, will you, uh, will you mow my lawn, right? Uh, and you say, sure, I'll go and do it. And then you send them an invoice and then they pay, that's a, that's a rock solid contract right there because you have offer in terms of, hey, will you mow my lawn? You have acceptance in two contexts there in terms of you saying, yes, I'll do it. And number two, you actually doing it, right? And, uh, and that also provides the value. And then the payment is simply, it's really outside of the contract because the contract is formed at the point of, of offer acceptance and then the performance of work. And payment is simply uh the other side of the contract the exchange of value Thank you, yeah. all right well if you if you come up with uh, any subsequent questions whether it uh, be in relation to drones or public works act claims or what have you all of our email addresses are on the um placemat uh there so so if you, something comes to your mind after the fact, please feel free to email or call or, or, uh, or even uh, speak after uh, the seminar is done today. So wanted to thank everyone very much for coming. Thank you for the uh, web uh, invitees. Thank you for uh, uh, the clients who came. Thank you also to the members of Denton's uh, offices who claimed, uh, came, pardon me. Thanks uh, for the audio visual uh, work and thank you in particular to, uh, to Catherine for coming from uh, Toronto to provide her a very helpful presentation. Thank you.